I welcome you to our Founders Day convocation. Uh, the University Singers will now perform their opening selection, Sidivit Anima Mea.
Thank you, University Singers, uh, under the direction of Professor Shane Lynch. We celebrate Founders Day and gather for convocation by the direction of the Board of Trustees on the birthday of Robert E. Lee, who served as our university's president from 1865 to 1870. On this occasion, we reflect upon the people whose vision, leadership, and hard work gave rise to this university, in which we take pride and in which we now devote our own energy. We reflect upon the purposes and the values that abide as the common thread connecting the members of this community across decades and centuries during which so much else has changed. And we reflect upon our motto, non incautus futuri, not unmindful of the future, which expresses our commitment to honor the past, not from a desire to remain frozen in time, but rather as a source of inspiration to direct our own efforts for the benefit of those who will follow us in the decades and the centuries to come. At the heart of Washington and Lee University lies the conviction that the future is best served by education. From that conviction grows a communal ethos to devote ourselves to cultivating the considerable potential of our students so that they in turn may contribute powerfully to making the world a better place. The two men for whom our school was named exemplified this ethos in their own words and deeds, as have thousands of other individuals who've sustained the quality, character, and success of this university over the 269 years of its existence. Our distinguished speaker this evening, Charles Dew, is a nationally recognized scholar of the American South before and after the Civil War. His address will draw upon his most recent book, The Making of a Racist, which is a highly acclaimed memoir of his growing up in the segregated South. Professor Dew's previous book, Apostles of Disunion, is an insightful and influential study of the causes that led the southern states to secede. The apostles referred to in his title were the secession commissioners appointed by five states, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana, that had already seceded by January of 1861. These men were sent out carrying what Professor Dew refers to as the gospel of disunion to persuade the other slave states to join the Confederacy. Dew examines their speeches and letters to demonstrate that these commissioners appealed to their fellow Southerners on the grounds that their culture and their economy depended on the preservation of slavery, which depended on seceding from the Union. The commissioner sent from Georgia to press the case in Virginia was Henry Lewis Benning, for whom Fort Benning is named. He opened with a rhetorical question. What was the reason that induced Georgia to take the step of secession? To which he then provided a simple answer. This reason may be summed up in one single proposition. It was a conviction, a deep conviction on the part of Georgia, that a separation from the North was the only thing that could prevent the abolition of our slavery. Benning concluded by asking the Virginians, whose indecision on the question of secession he could not fathom, what objection then can you have to joining us and going with your interest in preference to going with the North and going against your interest? You can have none as far as I can see. Why then will you not join us? Robert E. Lee was not a member of the Virginia Assembly charged with deciding the question and thus not present to hear Benning's speech. But from Fort Mason, Texas, where he was stationed as a colonel in the United States Army, he penned a direct rejoinder in a letter to his son. Secession is nothing but revolution. I do not believe in secession as a constitutional right, nor that there is a sufficient cause for revolution. Benning and the other commissioners made it plain that they thought the preservation of slavery justified secession and war. Lee made it equally plain they were wrong. He did not hold progressive views on race, but Lee argued Virginia had neither right nor reason to secede, and he told his son, if Virginia stands by the old union, so will I. The Virginia Assembly initially agreed with Lee, voting by a two-thirds majority, which included the two delegates from Lexington, to remain with the union. But a mere two weeks later, after the battle at Fort Sumter, a second ballot was called and enough votes switched sides, including one from Lexington, to tip the balance for secession. We can only imagine a counterfactual world in which the Virginia Assembly stuck with its original decision, 
Lee accepted Lincoln's offer to lead the Union Army, and perhaps he became the President of the United States rather than the President of Washington College. But Virginia did leave the Union, and Lee went with it. Colonel Ty Sigley, WNL class of 84, head of the History Department at West Point, sitting here intimidatingly in the front row, <laughs> whom we are about to honor with induction into ODK, gave an extraordinary talk on this very stage last September in which he reminded us that Lee's choice was neither necessary nor common. The other US colonels from Virginia sided with the Union. How indeed we cannot help but wonder could a man agree to lead an army on behalf of a cause that he expressly considered unconstitutional and unwarranted. Lee explained himself in sworn testimony after the war when Congress demanded to know why he did not consider himself a traitor. Lee responded that he believed he had an obligation that superseded both his personal opposition to secession and the duty he also felt to his country. He said, my view was that the act of Virginia in withdrawing herself from the United States carried me along as a citizen of Virginia and that her law and her acts were binding on me. Lee thus resolved to give his all in the service of the cause advocated by the apostles of disunion with whom he disagreed. But his identity as an American and his feeling for the country survived the war and shaped his response to surrender. Lee became an apostle of reunion. He encouraged Southerners to lay down their arms, return to work and school, and build themselves a future. He led by example, taking up the presidency of Washington College only four months after Appomattox, because he regarded education as essential to the prospects of young people whose lives had been devastated by the war and to the larger project of national reconciliation. It is this work of educating students for the future benefit of the communities in which they will live that we proudly carry on today at Washington and Lee. Charles Dew is the Ephraim Williams Professor of American History at Williams College, where he has taught since 1977. He's a nationally recognized scholar of American slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. On a personal note, Charles and I were colleagues for nearly 20 years, and I'm honored to count him as a mentor and a friend. When I served as the provost at Williams, my primary goal was to prevent Charles from retiring, since he continues to be one of the greatest teachers ever to serve on that faculty. His first book, Iron Maker to the Confederacy, Joseph R. Anderson and the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, received the Fletcher Pratt Award for the finest book on the Civil War published in that year. His second book, Bond of Iron, Master and Slave at Buffalo Forge here in Rockbridge County, was a finalist for the prestigious Lincoln Prize and selected by the New York Times Book Review as a notable book of the year. His third book, Apostles of Disunion, Southern Secession Commissioners and the Causes of the Civil War, is a landmark study widely taught in college classrooms around the country. In 2016, he published The Making of a Racist, A Southerner Reflects on Family, History, and the Slave Trade, which is the basis for his talk tonight. Please join me in welcoming Charles Dew. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here today. Um, I love this part of the world, uh, the valley, Rockbridge County, Lexington. I, I've spent years here in your county courthouse, among other places, uh, in my work on Buffalo Forge, and I feel like this is a second home. Uh, I'm particularly honored to be here on the day that the ODK is recognizing its new inductees. Uh, your, your leadership has earned you this. You have every right to be proud. Your families have a right to be even prouder. Uh, as a parent, I know how, how gratifying it is to see a child succeed as all of you have done. I'm gonna talk about a tough topic today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about race. The great W.B. Du Bois uh, in his Souls of Black Folk, published 1905, an absolutely extraordinary collection of essays. Du Bois said that the problem of the 20th century was going to be the problem of the color line. Well, here we are in the 21st century, and we're still living with that, that seed, that cancerous seed that was planted at the heart of the great American experiment at its founding. And that seed was the institution of slavery. You may be wondering why you got the handout that you got uh, when you entered today. 
Uh, I asked uh, Mark Connor, the provost, to make enough copies to distribute because I want to start with this. This is a, a document that I hand out at the beginning of my classes when I teach the history of the South, when I teach the Civil War and Reconstruction. I don't tell the students what it is. I just pass it out, Xerox, I'm an old-fashioned Xerox man. Uh, I put it in their hands and say, take a look at it and see what, see what you make of this. And gradually it dawns on them what they're looking at. They're looking at a price list of human beings. They're looking at men, women, and children commodified by livestock and offered up for sale to the highest bidder. What you're holding in your hand is the essence of the American slave system, the chattel principle, human beings as property. And I want this imprinted on their, on their minds and their hearts as they begin to study one of the most controversial subjects in American history, the slave South and the American Civil War. And I want to take two or three minutes to talk about this document today because this document led to this book. And this book is entitled The Making of a Racist and it's about me. And I wanted to use this as a bridge to my own story and then end with some thoughts that I hope will be helpful today. Take a look at this as a historian and as a Southerner or just an American. And what does it tell you? It's a printed form. They probably had a stack of these things in the office of Betson Gregory Auctioneer, Franklin Street, Richmond, Virginia. And they filled them out every day because the prices changed. The market fluctuated. And you can see this in the evidence that, that, that is in your hands. Uh, we'll do a little inside baseball, the kind of things historians love to do, and I'll just walk you through a couple of points that struck me. We beg leave to give you the state of our Negro market and quote them as follows. And then there are categories. Extra men, number one, doe. Doe means ditto in the 19th century. Second rate or ordinary, ditto. Extra girls, number one, ditto. Second rate or ordinary, ditto. And then boys four feet high, four three, four six, four nine, five feet. Girls of same height of boys about the same prices. Just think of this for a minute and think of the destruction of families represented just by what's represented on this sheet. And then the clerk for Betts and Gregory in that classic clerk's handwriting from the 19th century has added an up-to-date market report. The first line, Good young woman and first child, 1300 to 1450. Why is that in there? I asked my students. It doesn't take them very long to come up with the reason. She has proved that she can bear children. And since under slavery, the child took the condition of the mother. The master is not only buying this good young woman and first child, he is buying the promise and expectation that she will have more children. And since those children are human capital, they will add to his wealth. That's a special line in any slave market report from this era. And then the clerk has, has given you the kind of report if you're, if you're in the stock market, your broker might give you. Things are looking bullish, things are looking bearish. Look what the clerk has written. The market is dull this week, owing to the fact that there are but few Southern buyers in the market. That's what's driving the slave trade the cotton South, the enormous fortunes being made on short staple cotton grown and harvested by slave men, women, and children. Everybody was in the fields at harvest time. And here's where the inside baseball comes. You see that line that's been crossed out at the bottom? We do not look for this to continue, it says, if you read it carefully. What's going on here, I thought. And then I looked at the date. The date's been altered. This was originally prepared, I think, on August the 1st, when the mar market was looking pretty good. By August 2nd, which is written over the 1st, it's turned bearish. The fact that there are a few Southern buyers in the market, we do not look for this to continue. We don't know that those Southern buyers are gonna be here. That's as, as, as dramatic and as fluctuating as this market in human being was. 
The day we acquired this at my rare book library at Williams College, the archivist called me over and he said, Charles, I've just acquired something I think you would like to see. I said, sure, Bob, I'll be right over. So I, I, I walked in our, our Chapin library and he met me and he put this in my hands. And when I looked at it, I felt like somebody had slugged me in the stomach because there was the essence of something that my white Southern ancestors had not only been, not only been complicit in, they had played an active role in, in intellectually justifying and facilitating the continuance of this institution. I had an ancestor named Thomas Roderick Dew, who was asked by the governor of Virginia in 1831, in the wake of Nat Turner's slave insurrection, to write a review of the debates in the Virginia legislature over what to do about slavery in the wake of Nat Turner. Last full and free debate in the South on the institution of slavery. And in crafting his report on that legislative debate, Thomas Roderick Dew in 1832-33 laid the foundation for the pro-slavery argument, a pro-slavery orthodoxy that would dominate the intellectual life of the South for three decades leading up to the Civil War. My family weren't slave traders, but Thomas Roderick Dew was complicit in, in, in a very dramatic way in the institution that you see recognized here. That thought, how could they do this? How could these good people, these good Christian Southern white folk, my people, how could they do this? And then I had one of those rare moments, one of those lightning flashes that occasionally occur to us. And all of a sudden I realized that I, as a white Southern boy, growing up on the white side of the color line in the segregated South, the Jim Crow South, had been doing exactly the same thing. Not looking human bondage in the face every day, but looking the evil of racial segregation in the face every day and not seeing it. There it was, right in front of me, omnipresent, every day, and I didn't see it. How did that happen, I asked myself. How could I not see the injustice, the humiliation that was, that was visited on people every day just because of the color of their skin? And that prompted me to do something I never thought I would do, and that's write my own story. Historians are told to sort of Keep yourself out of the story. We're, we're, we're not the story. That's in the archives. Well, I guess I've been around long enough, Will, that I've decided to write what I want to write. And, and I decided that I would try to tell how I grew up, and then using my training as a historian, such as it is, I, I would look at the slave trade. I would read the, the, the letters, the surviving correspondence of the Richmond slave traders to try and understand the mindset behind this, the traders and their customers, those seeking to buy and sell slaves. I would read that correspondence, the most depressing research activity you can possibly imagine. I would read those letters and I would try to come to grips with this mindset to help me understand my own. And that resulted in this book, uh, part autobiography, part history, based on this document reprinted in the book because this is my vehicle for, for using this as a way to explain what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. This book, when it uh, came to me in dust jacket form from my publisher, the University of Virginia Press, rocked me back on my heels a little bit because that's my baby picture on the dust jacket. I was a pretty good, good looking kid. Uh, it's been a long downhill slide since then, but I'm sitting in my mother's lap. And you can imagine when I opened that PDF and looked at this and I said, oh my God. And then I had, I had this, this clarifying thought, this is perfect, this is exactly right. Because my first memories as a human being, the first thing I can remember about my life was sitting in my mother's lap, having her read to me. And the book, that she read to me from, that are my first memories I have with me today. And I'm gonna read briefly from it with an apology for reading in the dialect 
in which it is written. I found this book after my mother's death. My brother and I were going through the house. You know, anyone who has done this, you have to go through. It's a painful process to sort of clean things out and, and, and retrieve things that you want to keep. And there was a little bookcase outside the room that I occupied as a child. We called it the baby room. There was a little bookcase there. And I opened the glass door and I started pulling the books out. And the first book I pulled out was this book, Ezekiel. And I remembered that that was the book that my mother, we called her Dear. There's a story behind that. I won't bother to tell it to you. That was the story that Dear read to me when I was first able to, to sort of comprehend and remember things. And this is that book. And I'm going to read you a little bit from the first page of that book. I apologize for reading it in dialect, but that's how it's written. Away down in Sanford, Florida, there lives a little colored boy, and he names Ezekiel. And this boy, he lived with a pappy and his sister, Emancipation, and a brother, little plural, and asafetta to the baby. And one time, pappy didn't have no money to buy bread and butter and bacon and breeches and things. So one morning, when Ezekiel was dressing himself, he say, Mammy, these here breeches is so wore out, they won't hardly stay on. Mammy say, how are we going to get something to eat, much less britches? Your pappy ain't got no job. Ezekiel say, I get us something to eat. And goes out in the world to start the story. There's a little jingle at the end of each of these stories, also in dialect. And my mother and I would sing these jingles together. And I, I'd open the page to uh, the, the little song that's recorded here. It's, it's a wonderful spiritual roll, Jordan, roll. And my mother, in her very elegant hand, she had a wonderful handwriting, has written the word O-L-E o -L -E, in the first and fourth line to hear old Jordan roll, roll, Jordan, roll, roll, Jordan, roll. I wants to go to heaven when I die to hear old Jordan roll. She added that word to make it easier for us to sing, and she added it in dialect. My mother was, was a lovely woman. She was charming, gracious, decent, thoroughly, uh, what, remarkable in, in, in the way in which she interacted with human beings, white and black. Yet she thought nothing of reading this book to me. What did I learn from this? These folks are profoundly different than we are. They look different. Their, their, their faces are, are really obscure. They're stick figures. They have some hair spiking out. They wear gaudy clothes. They talk funny. They're profoundly different from, from us. And, and this is me when this was being read to me. And everything I grew up with in the South over my subsequent years reinforced and confirmed the image that was transmitted to me with my first conscious thoughts. My mother, despite her deep religiosity, despite her, her graciousness and her concern for others, believed that segregation was right and proper. The way she expressed it to me was, Charles, those folks on, are happy on their side of town. We're happy on our side of town. That's the way things were meant to be. My father was much more direct. He wore his racism on his sleeve. He used words that my mother forbade my brother John and I to use to describe people of another race. Both my mother and father were highly intelligent, well-educated people. My father was the first person in his family to go to college. His father died when he was quite young. His brothers sent him to UVA, both for undergraduate and law school. He returned to St. Petersburg, Florida, my hometown, and became one of the best lawyers in St. Petersburg. I remember one of my Sunday school teachers telling me he was the best lawyer in St. Petersburg. Yet my father was deeply racist and made no attempt to hide it. My mother brought into Jim Crow too, but in a much more gentle fashion than he did. And as I grew up, I took my cues from my parents 
There was an elaborate racial etiquette that governed the way white and black interacted in the South. Some of you in the audience who are my age or maybe a little younger or maybe even a little older, remember that etiquette. It's an odd word to describe racism, but you know what I'm talking about. You never shook hands with an African-American man, woman, child. You didn't use Mr. or Mrs. or Miss. You used first names only. There was a nice tile bathroom on the second floor that my family used. There was a not so nice half bath off the back porch used by Ed, the African-American man who, who mowed the grass and kept our lawn, and a wonderful woman named Illinois Browning Culver who cleaned for us, washed and ironed for us, occasionally cooked for us, and to whom my book is dedicated. And I'll explain why I did that. I never shook hands with, I didn't even know Ed's last name. I learned Illinois because I made it a point later in my life to get to know her. I've described this process of absorbing the races of my place and time as a process of osmosis. I absorbed it. It was nonverbal education, nonverbal communication. I simply followed the lead of people I loved, respected, my family, my friends, everyone I knew who I looked up to, bought into the Jim Crow system. I was a Confederate youth as I grew up. I brought that book with me too. I got it on my 14th birthday. It was a gift from one of my father's law partners. It's facts the historians leave out, a youth's Confederate primer. It's got the Confederate flag it's crossed on the cover. John Tilley is the author. Civil War was not about slavery, it was all about states' rights. The Yankees had brought the slaves over here anyway, and they were basically responsible for that. And besides, Southerners were decent folk, slaves were happy, well cared for, they were fairly simple, childlike people who were, were good workers in the field, and their masters and mistresses looked out for them. I got this on my 14th birthday. I also got a copy of Douglas Southall Freeman's three-volume History of the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's Lieutenant. Some of you probably know that three-volume work. I also got a firearm. I got a 22 caliber rifle. I asked my classes at Williams, because I use my own story when I teach Southern history. I, I asked my classes, how many of you got a firearm on your 14th birthday? I could ask that here, and some hands would go up. Last time I asked it, one hand went up. And I said, okay, where are you from? Macon, Georgia, he said. He was a Southern boy. And part of that rite in passage in my place and time, you turned 14, you went from boy to man, and you got a weapon. So I bought into that lost cause myth that you heard so eloquently described. When Ty gave his, when Ty gave his, his incredible uh, Constitution Day address here, I bought into that. I was not only a Confederate youth, I was also a youth of the Jim Crow South. And I remained frozen in that position when I went away to independent school, Woodbury Forest School over in Orange, Virginia. Um, I went there for three years and, and basically became even more entrenched in, in my Confederate uh, uh, history. Had a Confederate battle flag I hung in my dorm room. I crossed the Rapidan, I used to walk the trenches where Lee's men built a defensive line in the winter of 1863-4 before the Battle of the Wilderness. I was a youth steeped in the South. So how did I get out from under this rock? My father decided that my brother and I should go to Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. How in the dickens did that happen, you might ask? Well, my father, because of his own experience, believed deeply in education. And his measure of an educated person was how well they used the language. If they wrote well and spoke well, he asked them where they went to school. And he was in New York on business for one of his clients. 
And he kept running into these men who used the language in ways that impressed him. And when he asked where they went to college or university, a disproportionate number of them said, oh, Williams College. My father had never heard of the place, but he decided, okay, that they're doing a good job there. This is where I want my boys to go. And my older brother, John, who was two years ahead of me at Woodbury, was the first to go. John wanted to go to UVA and major in fraternity life. <laughs> That's not surprising. If any of you know Woodbury, it's a beautiful place, but it's all boys and it's all country. And he had had it up to here with that monastic life. He was ready for something else. No, my father said, you go to, you go to Williams for a year. If you don't like it, you can transfer. John loved it. I just toddled along after him. It was at Williams that I began to see from whence I had come. My education at Williams began before I walked into my first classroom. When I walked into my dorm, I realized that I had in my entry and would be living with me for the rest of the year and after an African-American classmate. His name was Ted Wynn. He was from Worcester, Massachusetts. And one of my first experiences on campus was telling a dialect joke, which I had learned as a Southern boy. All our, all, all our jokes were race related. And I was telling a dialect joke in a dorm room when Ted Wynn walked past the open door down the stairs of my dormitory. It was a Rastus and Lulabelle joke. Rastus had a deep baritone, Lulabelle had a high falsetto, and I was imitating the dialect and the voice. I was so embarrassed by this, I, 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 I'd never told this story until three years ago when I was teaching with an African-American colleague and the level of trust reached the point where I, I finally could, could, could let it out. I hadn't even told my wife. It is in the book. I couldn't abide not knowing if Ted had heard me. So the next day, I made it a point to approach him in the freshman quad, hold out my hand and say, hi, I'm Charles Dew. We're in the same entry. It was the first time I had shaken hands across the color line. I was 17 years old, had never been north of the Potomac. And here I was in the wilds of Western Massachusetts a southern boy adrift in a Yankee sea. Thank God it happened. Ted and I became friends, and my years at, at, at Williams College, the courses I took, the professors uh, that I studied with, my, my youth's Confederate history was blown out of the water. Let me tell you, this did not guide my, my learning once I reached a, a good college with a good faculty who had an honest approach to the past. I started noticing things I had never noticed before. I used to take the train back and forth to Williams. My father was an attorney. One of his, his clients was the Seaboard Airline Railroad through the heart of the South. And I rode his pass back and forth to school. And I remember sitting in the dining car, I was a freshman, and all the folks in the dining car were white and were seated at one end of the dining car and the other end of the dining car was empty. And the waiters who were all African-American at, at, at a certain point came and drew a heavy rest uh, green damask curtain across the center of the dining car. And when they did that, the African-American passengers were allowed into the dining car to sit on the other side of the curtain. I'd been riding trains for years. I had never noticed that. And in that moment, I thought, Ted Wynn couldn't sit here with me. He'd be on the other side of that curtain. And it was incidents like that, as I, as I began working my way through my Williams career, that began the process of undoing the making of a racist that occurred to me as I was growing up. Illinois Browning Culver was critical as a part of that experience, the, the woman who worked for us uh, as a domestic servant. Uh, when I got my driver's license, uh, I, I, I braved the, uh, the, the, the requirements of uh, parallel parking in a 1948 Cadillac with no power anything. I'm surprised Illinois would get in the car with me when I offered to take her home, but, but I did. I wanted to talk to her. As, as I began to see 
what was right there in front of me. I wanted to know about her life. And I remember breaking the ice with her one day. This was dangerous territory for her. For me to break that racial etiquette and talk to her about things that were verboten, that was not done. And that was risky for her. And I remember doing it, and I remember I used her, her son, Roosevelt, she had one child, and he had left St. Petersburg, Florida, which was Jim Crow to the eyeballs. He had left St. Petersburg as soon as he was old enough to get out and get a job. Gone to California, gotten a job with an airline, I think. And we were headed home one day, and I said, Illinois, I was going to try and open up a conversation, an honest conversation with her. I said, Illinois, it's a shame Roosevelt had to leave St. Petersburg because of something like race. And I saw her look over at me, and she paused. And then she said, it is a shame, Charles, it is a shame that he had to leave. And I knew then that we were on new terrain. We had reached a level of honesty with each other that, that allowed me to learn about her life and, and to educate myself about what I had been a part of, what I had been participating in, what I had been partially responsible for, the Jim Crow system. She told me things that were truly remarkable. She told me that she could buy a dress at a department store downtown but not a single department store would allow her to try that dress on. And when she got it home, if it didn't fit, she couldn't bring it back. She had a routine. She would, she would clean our house and she had a routine where she would reach the living room about the same time a quiz show came on. It was called The Price is Right. Bill Cullen. Anybody remember The Price is Right with Bill Cullen? We got some folks in the audience who remember that. And I remember one day I said, Illinois, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of interesting. We had one television, a big old Dumont television, was sitting in the living room. I said, it's, it, it's interesting the way you get to the living room just in time to watch Bill Cullen. You must be a big fan. And he said, I do like, she said, I do like that show, so, show Charles. That's the only show that has colored people on as guests. I was oblivious to this. Like everything else that I had been seeing every day. It, it, was, it was a revelation to me. And finally, one day, she said something to me that, that is at the core of this book. I don't recall the exact context, uh, context of this, this conversation, but I think I was saying something about, Illinois, these crazy customs, these, these segregation customs, these things are insane. And she looked over me and, and she was close to tears. And she said, Charles, why do the grown-ups put so much hate in the children? Why do the grown-ups put so much hate in the children? I knew as soon as she said it, she had nailed it. Racism was passed from one generation of white Southerners to the next like a genetic trait. That process of osmosis I described, it imbued us with an acceptance of an abomination. And that, that insight that she offered on that day has stayed with me ever since. And that is, is part of what I want to conclude with today. What we can do to break this genetic chain, because we have got to break it. We, we can't continue to let racism poison our, our, our civic and our national and our political life. We cannot, as a people, allow this to happen. I remember an incident that occurred when I was eight years old. And before I wrap things up, I think I'll tell it. It was just after World War II had ended. There was uh, automobile uh, rationing, uh, tires and gasoline were rationed during the war. We, we really didn't drive anywhere. Uh, once the war was over, VE Day, VJ Day, once the war was over, we took the car out again. And one morning, my father would, he would, he would drop me off uh, on the way to his law office. He would drop me off at my primary school. And one morning, as we were going out the side door of our living room to get in our 39 Buick, and he would drop me at school, an African-American man approached the house. 
His name was Bill. He ran a shoeshine parlor in an arcade down near my father's law office. And my father wore two-tone shoes called spectators. I bet there's some people here who know what spectators looked like. They were, they, they were very handsome men's shoes, but they were Dickens to polish. And, and he had them polished at Bill's shoeshine parlor. I don't know what had happened the day before, but something clearly had happened. And Bill came to our house to apologize to try and get my father's business back. I think what probably happened was one of the shoeshine boys, they were all grown men, had either said something or my father had overheard a conversation that he took offense and he had stormed out of the place. And Bill had come to make things right. And as he approached our house, I heard him say, Mr. Dew, I'm so sorry, when my father exploded in rage, cursing Bill. I don't remember what he said because I was too frightened. Cursing him, telling him to get out. What did he think he was doing? What had Bill done? He had approached our house, not from the back door, which was the only place an African-American domestic servant was, was permitted to use. He had approached our house to a side door and that induced this rage in my father. That was the South that I had to get out from under. Almost every Southerner from that era has a moment like that, black and white. If you read Lillian Smith's Killers of the Dream or Ann Moody's Coming of Age in Mississippi, these wonderful Southern autobiographies written across the color line, they describe this moment when either as a white Southerner or as a black Southerner, they learned what racism and segregation and the Jim Crow system was all about. How do we keep that from ever happening again? I wish I had a, a, a magic wand. I wish I had a genie I could pull out of a bottle. I don't. All I can offer is a few thoughts that have occurred to me in the course of, of thinking about where we are now and where I hope we can be. If you know any dialect jokes, toss them out. You don't need them. I'm not a big jokes fan anyway, but don't go there. Get rid of them. Get rid of stereotypes. Get rid of racial stereotypes. We all know what they are. They're corrosive. They're pernicious. They take an entire group of our fellow citizens and, and describe them and stigmatize them that recognizes nothing about their individuality, their worth. The stereotypes of, of the slave era, Sambo, Jezebel, Jack, the trickster, Nat, the violent slave, Buck, the sexually threatening slave. They have their modern counterpoints, welfare queens, gangbangers, the list goes on. Get rid of those stereotypes. They do evil. Think about this for a minute. That Jezebel stereotype was, was supposed to describe the, promiscu uh, the promiscuity of African-American women. And because of that Jezebel stereotype, the age of consent in South Carolina, the age of consent for girls was 10 to protect white boys against black Jezebels who would lure them into their bed and compromise them. Until 1895, 10. Stereotypes are destructive. Get rid of them. Don't support politicians who play the race card. Don't vote for them. Don't give them money. Southern demagogues have poisoned the well of Southern politics for generations. And that virus is spread. Don't lend your vote, don't lend your support to anyone who plays the race card. For those of you who are entering ODK today, again, congratulations. I hope at least some of you will think about public service as your career. Politics is tough. Running for office is tough. 
but we need you. The South needs you. The country needs you. Think about that as a life choice. And I know coming from this school with the education that you have received, you will represent all of your constituents if you do go into public life. If you hear racist comments, say something. Speak up. It's not easy. Southerners are inherently polite. We back off from, from unpleasant social situations. But if you hear racism and you don't say something, you are betraying your classmates, your teammates, your friends. Say something. My wife and I learned this lesson the hard way. Our older son is gay. And when he came out, he was in college. And it was the 90s. It was a different era. And my wife and I would go out, and we would hear homophobic comments. And we wouldn't say anything. And we'd internalize the anger that we felt over betraying our son and bring, us home, bring it home with us. And one night we sat down and we said, we're not going to do this anymore. If we hear this stuff, we're going to say something. And we started doing it. And boy, was that interesting. We saw some jaw drops uh, and, and we saw some, some eyes widen and we saw some people pause for a moment to think about what they had been doing, stigmatizing a whole group of men and women simply because of who they were. If you hear racist comments, say something. Most of all, I hope that each and every one of you will be a part of that generation that Illinois Culver asked us to be, the generation that refuses to put the hate in the children. Break that genetic chain. Listen to the better angels of your nature. Don't stand silent in the face of racism. If you can do this, you will have made a signal contribution to our civic life, and you'll feel good about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Charles, for your important and deeply personal and thought-provoking remarks. Founders Day is also a time for us to recognize several individuals for fulfilling the ideals of leadership and service. We do so by inducting them into Omicron Delta Kappa, the National Leadership Honor Society. Angel Vela de la Garza Evia is the president of the Alpha Circle of ODK. He's a senior from Monterey, Mexico, majoring in chemistry engineering and minoring in mathematics. He's a Bonner scholar, having logged over 2,000 service hours over the course of his WNL career. As a Bonner, Angel has been involved in Campus Kitchen and English for Speakers of Other Languages. He's part of the Campus Kitchen leadership team, where he leads cooking and delivery shifts. He's the current ESOL president, served for two years as the family coordinator and is also given English tutoring classes. In addition, he's part of the residential life staff where he coordinated the peer tutors program, was a resident advisor for the ARC summer program, and is now the assistant resident advisor for Gaines Hall. In 2017, Angel received the Davis Projects for Peace grant, giving him the opportunity to kickstart his program STEMITO, which helped redesign and refurbish a library at a public school in his hometown and conduct a month-long summer STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics program for 30 elementary students. Angel and a group of WNL students will be going to Monterey this coming Washington break. I'd like to go with you. 
to continue STEMITO's mission of getting students engaged with STEM. Please join me in welcoming Angel to the podium. Thank you, President Dudley, for your kind introduction. I would also like to welcome our distinguished guests, students, families, and friends, as we gather to celebrate the extraordinary accomplishments of our new initiates and anticipate their continued excellence in leadership, both here at Washington and Lee and in communities across the world. Our recognition of Founders Day coincides with the birthday of one of our namesakes, Robert Lee, and commemorates the leadership of the other namesake, George Washington. This week at Washington and Lee, we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. All around campus and, our, and throughout our community, there have been enriching events, ranging from student-led discussions that highlighted the importance of student activism at our campus to panels and speakers. Not even the freezing temperatures could stop our community from enjoying the unity that resonated through the streets of Lexington at the MLK Parade. These are signs that together we're progressing towards Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Indeed, Dr. King stands as one of the most passionate and impactful leaders this nation has ever seen. It is fitting then that we celebrate the leadership of students, faculty, alumni, and community members who have devoted themselves to leading and serving their communities and this nation. Just over a century ago, a select group of 15 Washington and Lee student and faculty leaders founded Omicron Delta Kappa to bring together leaders involved in the various spheres of college activities for the general good of the institution. Since its founding, the society has sought to honor those students, faculty, alumni, and community members who best demonstrate exemplary leadership. In the words of George Washington, impress upon the mind of every man from the first to the lowest, the importance of the cause and what it is they're contending for. As the Alpha Circle of ODK, we recognize those with deep-seated commitment to continued active participation in the Washington Lee community, strong spiritual and moral character, and service to the campus community and the world. We're confident that our initiates will continue to demonstrate outstanding leadership in the five areas recognized by the society. Scholarship, athletics, service, journalism, and the arts. Many of our initiates excel in more than one of these fields, while others represent incredible depth within a single sphere. So what makes a leader? It's a complex question that can take many forms. Could it be a combination of the actions that they take, the failures that they endure, or the selfless caring that they show to others that truly encompass the essence of leadership? All of our initiates today lead in formal, countable ways, but they also lead simply by building empathetical relationships and empowering those around them. I'm certain that you, our initiates, will follow the tradition of our founders and practice leadership daily. You'll have the potential to improve the world around you by serving others through honorable, original, and moral leadership. I'm humbled by the previous accomplishments and future trajectories of my fellow students and honor initiates honored here today. We will now recognize each of our initiates through the traditional tapping ceremony. I will begin today with our honorary initiates. I will recognize each individually and I ask that you hold your applause until all have been introduced. John M. Cleggern. John Cleggern is a member of Washington's League class of 1984. 
Since 2008, he has served as pastor of the Caldwell Presbyterian Church in Charlotte, a church that has embraced its call to be a diverse, progressive, and mission-oriented congregation centered on justice and advocacy. Before entering the ministry, he retired early from Bank of America as a senior vice president and after various public relations and public policy roles. Prior to that, he was a reporter for the Charlotte Observer. Reverend Cleghorn has served his alma mater as chair of the Board of Trustees Ad Hoc Committee on External Relations, vice chair of Jung Alumni for the Annual Fund, class agent, member of the Alumni Board of Directors, and as a member of the Charlotte Area Campaign Committee during the past two capital campaigns. He previously received the Distinguished Young Alumnus Award. He and his wife, Kelly, have two daughters, Ellison and Sophie. Marcia B. France. Marcia France is the John T. Herwick, MD, Professor of Chemistry and Associate Provost at Washington and Lee. She earned her SB at MIT, where she did undergraduate research under Nobel Laureate K. Barry Sharpless and earned her MS at Yale. She was a National Science Foundational Pre-Doctoral Fellow at Caltech, where she earned her PhD in Organic Chemistry. Her work is cited in the 2005 Nobel, Peace, Nobel Prize address by her research mentor, Robert H. Grubbs. Dr. France is co-author of 20 research publications, holds 13 patents, and has mentored over 50 research students. At Washington and Lee, Dr. France has taught introductory and advanced organic chemistry as well as a spring term abroad course on the science of cooking in Italy. She served as associate dean of the college. She helped found the St. Andrews Study Abroad Program. She has served as a member of the Hillel Advisory Board and the Phi Beta Kappa Executive Board. She plays flute and piccolo with the Rockbridge Symphony Orchestra, the Washington Lee University Wind Ensemble, and the Lexington Flute Ensemble. Joan Manley. Joan Manley is an advocate for the safety, opportunity, and access for our entire community. She was responsible for Lexington's efforts to fund and create curb cuts to assist in making the downtown more accessible. She founded the Rockbridge Area Transportation System, which enables residents to get to medical services and other destinations safely and affordably. Ms. Manley serves as a member of the Rockbridge Disabilities Board is a steering committee member of the Rockbridge Area Mobilizing for Action through Planning and Partnerships, is chair of the Rockbridge Area Conservative Council Transportation Committee, and the Rockbridge Advocates for Community Involvement. She was appointed chair of the Olmsted Oversight Advisory Commission that worked to get the disabled population the opportunity to live at home rather than confined to institutions. Ms. Manley was honored by the local Chamber of Commerce as the People's Choice Citizen of the Year. She was named Ms. Wiltshire, Virginia, with her motto being, making choices and having choices to make. Both the Virginia Senate and House of Delegates have recognized her accomplishments with resolutions. James T. Siddeley. Ty Siddeley is a member of the Washington Lee class of 1984. He holds a master and PhD from Ohio State University. He's a US Army colonel who has commanded cavalry and armor units in the United States, Germany, Italy, the Balkans, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. He's professor of history and chair of the history department at the US Military Academy at West Point. Among his many accomplishments as a scholar are the West Point history of warfare, the West Point history of the Civil War, the West Point History of World War II, the West Point Guide to the Civil Rights Movement, and the West Point Guide to Gender and Warfare. In addition, he has written on institutional history, including Civil War memory and African American history. Colonel Seidel is a youth basketball coach on the Vestry of Holy Innocence Episcopal Church and on the Board of Trustees of Putnam County Historical Society. Please join me in congratulating our honorary initiates.
I will now recognize the undergraduate class of 2018 by calling them to the stage. You can find a brief biography of each initiate in the program. Please hold your applause until all have been recognized. Brett Thomas Becker. Ryan Jefferson Brink. Thomas Sullivan Caldwell. Michael Ian Colabita. Audrey Taft Dangler. Sarah Riley Dotter, who was unable to be here today. Hannah Lynn Falchuk. Andrew Caleb Gablin. Benjamin Christopher Gee. Mary Frances Elizabeth Hall. Tessa Marie Horan. Truth Osivie Ijiwari. Matthew Joseph Lubis. Alicia Martinez. Faith Elizabeth Pignon. Alden Cook Shade. Bowen Hamill Mary Spotswood. Mary Paige Welch. As the seniors return to their seat, please join me in congratulating them. I will now recognize the undergraduate class of 2019 by calling them to the stage. Please hold your applause until all have been recognized. Haley Corinne Tucker. Heath Barnardu V. Elizabeth Nyawera Mugo. Alexander Paul Dolwick. Faith Abigail Isbell. Ethiopia the Melaj Getacho. As the juniors return to their seats, please join me in congratulating them.
I will now recognize the law school classes of 2018 and 2019 initiates by calling them to the stage. Please hold your applause until all have been recognized. Law class of 2018, John Sterling Hauser. Thomas Edward Arthur Bishop. Craig Alan Carrillo. Erica Lise Sig. Jacob Evan Thayer. Law Class of 2019. Zachary Tate Crawford Pechucas. Car Carol Bennett Neal. Maya Harkness Ginga. Daniel Marina San Roman. Caitlin Bentry Mary Peterson. Angelique Rudico Rogers. As the law initiates return to your seats, please join me in congratulating them. Thank you for helping us recognize the initiates to ODK today. Thank you, Angel. On behalf of the Washington Lee community, I offer warmest congratulations to all of the new initiates who exemplify the ODK ideals of leadership through service, obligation to others, and individual sacrifice. To our new initiates, please take a moment to look upon the accomplishments of the honorary initiates. Take inspiration from them and set your sights high. We will be watching with great interest as you grow as university leaders, as well as leaders in your professions and communities in the years to come. We'll all please stand as the chamber singers perform the Washington and Lee hymn. We will be adjourned upon its completion. Thank you all very much for attending. In the shadows of bright colors, we stop to hear the chimes. Born steps on which we linger, slowly yield to time. Oh.